That's, that, that's part of it. But that itself may take another 25 years because you should have done it 50 years ago. Therefore, even without waiting for the 25 years while we continue to do that, can you do other things to make people realize it very fast? That's where the skill lies. Somebody must. Sir, I just want to know, uh, now these days, four stars and two stars are being elected for the Rajya Sabha, sir. So is it really necessary for them, uh, uh, because they are busy with something else, instead of electing them, can't they elect uh, any useful person? <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a good question. Sadly, in our country, being in parliament or assembly has become the attribute, of, it's, it's become the desire of everybody, without even wondering why. Many people actually want to be prime ministers and chief ministers, not even knowing what they would do. Seriously, many people who aspire for chief ministership and prime ministership, if you actually ask them privately or even publicly, all right, let's assume that you are the next chief minister or prime minister, what is your vision? What are the three things you would do and in what manner? Their answers would be worse than that of a fifth grade kid. Because in a fifth grade, if you have a debate about what would you do if you are prime minister, the poor kid, you know, thinking that the Prime Minister simply can sign and then everything will happen. He will say, I will remove unemployment, I will eliminate poverty, and all kinds of things they say. You can understand, you can forgive that if you're a uh, ten-year-old kid. That's exactly what this philosophy is. But why blame them? Or the political parties who put them up, why do they put them up? They think that if a Tendulkar is made an MP, many Tendulkar fans will vote for them. If a Chiranjeevi is an MP, many Chiranjeevi fans will vote for them. The real answer is, are we as people willing to vote in a sensible manner? At this point of time, the answer is, not always. Therefore, we'll get these things for some time. There's no substitute to this. And therefore, electoral system change and political culture and decentralization of power. Can we attempt those things so that people slowly realize that there's a different way of doing things? Unfortunately, even when they are taught, they are taught in a very sterile and normative manner. Exactly. Definition of state, definition of democracy, blah, blah, blah. Not exactly why and what is happening. Exactly. And also but, but luckily, this deficiency can be overcome. After all, if you acquire knowledge, I can learn from you. See, mankind has this unique facility. If somebody over a lifetime has labored and understood all these things, you don't have to labor for another lifetime. Then we'd be very unwise. We can learn that quickly if it's institutionalized and if it's in a form that can, that can be transferred. Now in Lok Sattva, that's what we have done. We probably have unmatched knowledge in the country. I don't think any prime minister, any chief minister, any party leader, any NGO leader can match us in terms of this understanding and knowledge. But we have institutionalized it increasingly. It's available. Now, are you willing to learn? You really want to pick up um, uh, this knowledge on the basis of our experience and then build on that? If you're willing, it's available. And you don't all have to be experts. If you get a broader idea, even education, there are, there are extraordinarily simple ways of doing things. It's not a problem. But everything boils down to one issue, incentives. Incentives are the key, key uh, lever. The incentives for the child, for the teacher. How do you really alter the incentives? After all, what do you all want? You want success. Success defined as a pass and a mark and a rank. Supposing that success, that success is now achieved in a certain manner. Suppose that success comes in a different manner. It's still the success. Everything changes. So why is leadership important? Leadership is what determines what kind of incentive should be there. The right leadership, right incentives, right structures, right institutions, they get right outcomes. You get lousy incentives, lousy structures, you get lousy outcomes. Leadership is about building those. Nobody can say, you shall do this way. It's not God that will say, let there be sun, and sun suddenly comes. You have to build institutions to really alter human behavior. Power is about altering human behavior. It's about utilizing resources 
It's about altering human behavior, inspiring people, or creating incentives, whatever way, altering human behavior. True power is not about being chief minister. True power is about making all Hyderabadis actually drive on the left side or respect the traffic uh, signals. If you are the Prime Minister of India but nobody respects traffic signals, where is power in that? You simply are a nuisance there, that's all. So our fellows under, have, haven't understood what power is about. Power is about altering human behavior and changing outcomes. And if you understand that, we can get many things done easily. First question is? Okay. First question, you know, it doesn't matter whether Narendra Modi or um, uh, Nitish Kumar or somebody. One nice thing that's happening in the country is because of maturing of federalism, even in the midst of many things that are going wrong in the past 20 years, federalism has matured. Therefore, in states, there is now space for leadership to emerge and make a difference and set an example. In Gujarat or in Bihar, for instance, now you see some, some of this hope. Bihar was really seen as hopeless 15 years ago. But suddenly now, you see things are improving, therefore there is a hope. Gujarat was always relatively better economically for a variety of reasons. But Narendra Modi, even within that, showed that there's a way of doing it better. Though some of what Narendra Modi stood for, or some of his actions and actions are not liked by many people, quite rightly. But the other part of what he had done, many people admire and they, they believe, if you take out Narendra Modi's misdeeds, this part of it must be emulated, either by Modi or somebody else, doesn't matter. So it's really about adopting the best practices. It's really about, for instance, if you take power sector, I myself have demonstrated in Andhra Pradesh, in Lok Sattva movement, how we can improve power situation in Andhra Pradesh. We have taken, uh, on a franchise basis, a substation in West Kodavari district, Karla Cheru. We have reduced the distribution losses by 19%. 19%. We have, we have ensured that there is very high quality of power so that there's no voltage fluctuation and motors in agriculture sector, for instance, are not burnt at all. In fact, one local mechanic, he came and complained once, sir, I used to have two or three meter motors burning out every day, but now I have no work at all because motors are not burnt. It was possible if you do it the right way. And then the corruption has completely disappeared. Supposing the transformer or something went out of order, Within a few hours, at a very fraction of the cost compared to the earlier time, we could set it right. All this is demonstrated. Then I started talking about it in the state, telling the government, look, this is the way to do it. Please do it in all of Andhra Pradesh. You know what the government did? They took it back from me and destroyed it. Because as long as the example is there, and I was shouting from rooftops, government had no defense. They had to do something. Once you take it over and destroy it, over. And Gujarat exactly followed what we did. They created separate agricultural transformers. They metered most agricultural power. If they don't meter, if the people didn't want meters, they still charge them the tariff which is equivalent to meters. They discovered that the average consumption in Gujarat was about 8,500 um, units of power per year for a five horsepower motor. And therefore, either you meter your power connection, your, your motor, or if you don't want metering, they charge on the basis of average consumption per unit 50 pi so that the same amount is collected. Either way. Either horsepower basis, 850 rupees per horsepower, or if it's metered per unit 50 pi. Either way, it's the same amount. Therefore, they removed the false incentives. They separated agricultural transformers from the rest. They gave 24 hour rural power. Once the, these three things are done, outcomes dramatically change. Now, you may or may not like Narendra Modi. You may or may not like Congress or BJP or TDP or some other party, but what they have done is something worth doing in the rest of the country. That's the way to go about it. Move from freebies to 
a, a, an incentive system where the better outcomes are possible and make people realize that you have something to gain by that. That's the context in which there's a lot of discussion in the country about Narendra Modi or Nitish Kumar for that matter or others. That's the way we should look at it. Don't bother too much about Congress or BJP. Every party has its flaws, its problems. But are there some good things that we can emulate in the rest of the country? Are there bad things we can avoid? Then uh, the second question you asked is about, I forgot now, what's that? One, one word. Pardon? Judiciary. Judiciary. No. Decentralization and access are definitely necessary. That's why we fiercely argued for and we got this law, Gram Nyala's bill and law, was actually a creation of Lok Sattva. I still remember when Bharadwaj, who is now the governor of uh, Karnataka, was a law minister. I personally sat with him and persuaded him that day after getting the NSC's approval. And finally, the bill has become law in 2009, years after left NAC. That is actually decentralizing the judiciary, making it accessible, inexpensive, in summary justice so that quick uh, answers are there. But if you mean by decentralization that a Nyaya Panchayat, a group of the citizens, they should render justice. In Indian context, I'm completely opposed to that. It will not work. Already cop, this, this caste panchayats and other things are there. Already our society is riven by so many dissensions and fractures. And if you now give the power to decide, even if the fellow decides well, other people do not trust him. Therefore, when the judicial process is already in place in the country, despite many failings of judiciary, there is general respect and confidence in judiciary. It is better to use that mechanism in a more sensible manner make it faster and better, more summary for simple cases, more accessible, rather than now creating a politically driven or communally driven or caste ridden Nyaya Panchayats, which will completely lose credibility. Therefore, it's not wise, not in this country. And that's why in India, we should not also think in terms of a, a, a peer-reviewed um, jury system. That will not work in India, because people don't have confidence in that. All these things are really about confidence. If you don't trust the man who is deciding, even if he decides well, the system will not work. You must first have faith in him. If you don't trust the, the fellow who is judging, no matter how much competence you bring, it doesn't matter. It's not wise. It's a lot here. You mentioned that when the legislator has to lead, like, he has to come up with like about 5 crores or something, and like, which he doesn't need to come from his pocket, and it's the system that drives him. I don't want to comment on politics, but let's see the similar scenario that we are facing in the education industry. Because I said education has not been the education what has been considered last time but our biggest industry. Like to become a doctor if I have to spend 5 to 10 million from my pocket. So anyway when I come into like practicing, my motives and my things will be driven by the fact that I pay 5 to 10 million. And as it said that in today's era, we see the education is something which not you're, only you're, about. You are absolutely right. That's why, what is the role of the state? We all must really go back to that. In this country, there's too much of stupid discussion on public sector versus private sector. That's not the discussion that's right. What should the state be doing? The state's primary focus should be public order, justice, and rule of law. Then basic infrastructure, power and transport in particular in the current context, because communications mercifully is now resolved in the country. And then education and health care. Because unless education is accessible, education of reasonable quality to every single child, you can never create conditions for social equality in India. The birth will determine the future of the child. Money will drive the education. I'm not saying money should not be there at all, but if for want of money, educational access is limited, then you're not creating a democratic system. And that's where India has failed. That's the reason why I keep focusing on uh, this PISA survey or Russell survey or something else and drive home the point that Indian system has completely collapsed in terms of education. I'm totally in agreement with you. It does not mean that there is no space for private sector and education. I believe there should be many sectors, private, uh, non-profit, and government sector, both all operating, so that people have increasing choice. But people should not be compelled to pay out of pocket. There must be mechanisms by which, doesn't matter who is the service provider, I get service that I want, I believe is best, without having to pay out of pocket if I, don't, if I can't afford it. If somebody who is rich wants to spend 5 million rupees for his daughter's education, that's his problem. But without having to spend that kind of money, I must be able to give my daughter decent education. It's possible. Many countries have done it. We haven't even made an attempt. And frankly, even if they take 5 million rupees but give good education, I'll be happy. 
you are getting rotten education after spending money. Therefore, your, the problem you raise is a very fundamental one, a very real one. We can address it, but I don't see any will at this point of time on the part of political people. That's why I am very, very um, aggressively supportive of this global service so that the competition, you know, if, if we realize what's happening to our children, then we will drive the system. I was with the Secretary of Education the other day, a close friend of mine. He is opposed to PISA surveys. I believe he is wrong. I told him, look, at least it becomes a pressure, pressure point. If where India stands is known widely to people, all people across the country, irrespective of caste, region, or religion, we all want our children to do well. If we understand that our children are getting rotten education in this country, then we will put the pressure, because the government will not put the pressure. The politician is not interested. Bureaucracy is ineffective. Let the people put the pressure. For that, they must be informed. They must know that this is not what education ought to be. And how do you tell them? You give a lecture? A simple thing. Look, why should you be 73rd when China is number one? To me, that's a powerful tool. And if tomorrow, instead of 73rd, you become 25th, then we know, yes, there's a measurable improvement. I'm sure every testing is flawed. I have no doubt that in peace also there are difficulties. But something or other, there must be a measurable way by which the, the demand side is strengthened and people's voice is strengthened. Okay? First, I made a choice of becoming a doctor. <laughs> okay, then now we are a politician. We as candidates of triple IT, we also have few choices to make. But there are many people who can't make choices in their life. Like, if they have to eat for a day, they have to work. They have no other choice. They have no choice of spending a day without working. So, how can you expect such people to think about these things? You said, yeah, we have to make a thing. So, what did you do as a politician like, to expand their choices? First of all, life is not all or none. It's not about this or that. Whether I was a medical doctor or a civil servant or a civil society leader, politics came very late, much later. Or now, political work. It's all the same, really. This notion that these are different things is wrong, fundamentally. Only thing is, sometimes I'm paid from the government, a salary, Sometimes I'm not paid. Sometimes you have a position, sometimes you have no position, but you're doing the same thing. It's the vehicle you're choosing for a destination. The vehicle doesn't matter which one, whichever is effective, you use it. Don't be too wedded to the vehicle. If tomorrow I come to the conclusion that the political work is actually a burden something to me, and I'm not able to get the outcomes for the country because of this hindrance, I will happily give it up. I will not think everybody in the, in the state and the country knows that. They all know that I don't care uh, at all about this position or any other position. I was a member of the National Advisory Council. I was at the Administrative Reforms Commission. I gave up all those things cheerfully. Not with the sense of sacrifice, because I felt they were a hindrance. They are not letting me achieve what I needed to achieve for the country. I happily gave up. And I don't have a sense that I lost something, no. So, you can do many things together. Ultimately, your first obligation is to yourselves. You must take care of yourselves. There's no doubt about it. Therefore, I would never urge you to all sacrifice. Many people come to me with starry-eyed notions. Sir, I'm so inspired, I want to sacrifice. I tell them, I don't want you to sacrifice the last drop of your blood, because I'm not a blood sucker. I don't want you to sacrifice you know, until the last breath. You know, what do I do with your breath that is already released and full of carbon dioxide? All I need is be practical citizen. Take care of yourself, but you always have energy and time if you're smart enough and if you're passionate enough to be able to devote and fuse your own private life and work with public good. And as you do more and more of it, avenues will open up. Supposing you actually are able to make a significant impact and therefore some people are willing to fund you in that kind of work, maybe you'll find that instead of this, you can be more effective there. It's really like a business. Not business in the sense of making profits, in the sense of your time getting the best dividends for the country. I work like a businessman. I don't work like a a uh, nice, good NGO fellow. For the amount of time and effort I put in, I want the best outcomes for the country, not some small outcomes. I must make a choice every minute, every hour. If I did not uh, make it uh, intelligible to you in the last hour and a half, then obviously I have failed. Every one thing that has been pursued by Lok Sattva or me 
with great success. We achieved more successes in this country than any group achieved anywhere in the world after Second World War. But we don't talk too much about it because if you talk too much about it, your capacity to do more things is diminished. God makes great things happen through people who do not care who get the credit. And also a recognition that there is so much more to be done. What you've done is necessary but not sufficient is important, that humility is important. So everything that we are doing is essentially to expand this choice for the country and for the citizens. If I am talking all the time about uh, uh, this PISA survey and I was sort of more or less, uh, I'm the person who is talking most about it in India, it's because I'm pushing the country to have more choices for the young people, among other things. Whether in democracy and political system being operated, or education and healthcare, I'm the author of the National Health Mission, which is now truncated into the National Rural Health Mission. I got it implemented in the country. So there are many things that we are doing and we have to do continuously to make these choices wider. But the point I'm making is, it's not all or none, it's not black or white. You must learn to fuse these things. Even as I am with you, supposing my daughter telephones to me or my wife telephones to me saying that, look, uh, the son or daughter is very sick and you need uh, to do something. What will I do? Will I say that, look, my country is very important, therefore my spending another 20 minutes here is much more, I'll say, sorry. I have to attend to my daughter's health, I go and take care of her. You must know how to fuse both these things. But on a day-to-day -day basis, if the daughter says, Dad, I want to spend some more time, I say, sorry, Betty, there's more value for my time, and therefore, unless really I'm needed, you have to give up that. And therefore, I could not give time for my family in the past 25, 30 years. I don't regret it. But it doesn't mean that you become sannyas. So you have to, there is some price to pay, but you have to learn to, to handle all these things together. Life cannot be monochromatic. Uh, sir, given your previous answers, this may be a wrong question to ask, but I'm just curious to know as to uh, what you realistically think is the time frame in which a party like Lok Sakta will gain electoral success? Forget, again, I know, forget supposing Lok Sakta does not get electoral success, let's assume. Does it mean that India is finished? No, it doesn't. So that's the curiosity. If you would Therefore, you are starting with the wrong thing. Repeatedly, I'm telling you, whichever vehicle takes us to the destination, we'll use that. It doesn't matter whether this vehicle is good or not. If it's good, we'll use it. At any point of time, we make a judgment that this may be a good vehicle. Or sometime, we may think, look, this vehicle doesn't really work, therefore, let me use another vehicle. Therefore, whether you have a party or you work non-party, doesn't matter. Therefore, the question is really, do I think that India will significantly change the way things are done in the next few years? The answer is emphatically yes. I believe in the next few years, and I mean a few years, at the most four to five years, we are now in that cusp where some fundamental change is possible by changing a few critical levels. You don't have to change everything. It doesn't have to be a revolution. But that change is now well within your grasp. Now, are we as a people, and some of us who are working for it, are we as individual leaders and uh, citizens, do we have enough sense and ability to really grasp that opportunity and push that cause? We, I think, must acquire that capability and push that cause. But I believe it's eminently within our grasp, and I passionately believe that, and I'm working very hard for that. Hopefully, in the next two, three years, some of the big changes will actually happen. We're very close to that. Sir, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, how many people do you think uh, were part of the um, Indian parliament have read the whole constitution at least once and have it in their mind? And the second, uh, and, and the second question is, uh, how much percentage of CBI you think is corrupt? And how much, uh, what is the probability that a person who is held by CBI comes to justice? Okay. First question, it's not necessary for everybody to really study the Constitution of India. If you have a broader sense of what the constitutional spirit is and some understanding of the key, key provisions of the Constitution, that's more than adequate. And if everybody tries to become a, a master of the Constitution, then you know, you're expecting too much. Nowhere in the world does it happen that way. That is for the scholars and the lawyers and judges. And most of them, they get it wrong anyway. So it's not important. Now, if you're talking about um, the second question is? CBI. CBI is generally a non-corrupt organization. You can be reasonably confident about that. Uh, it's also reasonably professional and capable, but it's not well endowed. You know, the whole CBI has only about 6,000 personnel, of whom the investigators are only about 2,000 or so. 
For a country of 1.2 billion people, it's abysmally small. Take the FBI, they have 60,000 personnel, well equipped, well trained. So what we require is to strengthen CBA in terms of number of personnel, the technology, the training, professionalism. But fundamentally, it's as good an organization as almost any other in the country. It's, it's a relatively clean, professionally sound, and motivated organization. Occasionally, there might be some political pressures at the highest level in CBI, only at the director's level. At the other levels, the culture of the organization being such that there is hardly any political interface and pressure. So many of the conceptions are wrong. They're incompetent because we simply have not endured them adequately. We simply don't have in a fast-changing world, in a technological world, they simply don't have the capability to handle these complex challenges, neither technology, nor personnel, nor resources. That's what needs to be addressed. And the last one is? Okay. We will conclude with the last three. It's a, it's a good question. It's also a, a doubtful proposition because the Supreme Court will certainly have to adjudicate whether it's an infringement of the freedom of uh, speech or not. But certainly in the rest of the democratic world, they have imposed certain restrictions on media holdings. Not in this way, at least I do not recall any case where the political work precluded them from having a media channel or newspaper. But certainly cross-holding is not permitted. If you have, let's say, a newspaper, you can't have a television in many cases. And also, if you have a certain viewership or readership, then the monopoly is prevented. You are not now allowed to further grow. Consciously, they made some of these efforts. In the United States, for instance, they have fairly strong regulation. But uh, can this be attempted? I don't know whether it's, it's a justiciable thing, therefore will the courts agree or not. But even if the courts agree in a practical sense, I'm a politician, I'll make my wife or my son have a media thing. And no law on, uh, on earth can say, because your father is a politician, you cannot hold a newspaper. So in a practical sense, it will not work. We have to look at it in a much more sophisticated manner. Democracy cannot be determined by examinations or disqualification. No, what you have to do is, we have to frame the question slightly differently. While there is no substitute to some form of electoral process whereby the people transfer their sovereignty to representatives. That's what democracy is. That's what legitimacy in democracy is about. But at the same time, can you ensure that there is an element of professionalism coming into government in a much more free and easy manner than today so that the outcomes are not compromised. That's a different question altogether. You cannot have representation by any other form except election. Now, what, what system of election, which is a better one, these are matters of detail. The second thing is, can we make this power locus as close to people as possible through decentralization so that people actually can participate much more and also can hold those fellows elected to account? These are the two approaches. But don't think of eliminating democracy in some guys or other and then having unelected element then you're no longer talking democracy. It's neither feasible nor desirable. 